before I start the workout, I always do a 10 minute warm up walk. I normally do it outside. We're just doing it inside today. It's also like 106 degrees outside, so kind of hot. This is also when I drink my pre-workout. And uh, I typically try and get the pre-workout in 20 to 30 minutes before my first working set of the workout. And this is basically so that the caffeine in the pre-workout has hit by the time I'm doing that first exercise at a heavy weight. The reason for that is that caffeine itself actually helps with strength. And so it's not really relevant until you're, you're at that you know, heavy fatiguing set. So if I'm working out before 4 p.m., I have caffeinated pre-workout. If I'm working out after 4 p.m., then I am having the non-caffeinated pre-workout. The difference between them is literally just the caffeine. Everything else is identical. I'm having my proteins pre-workout. In addition to the caffeine, it has beta alanine and L-citrulline. Beta alanine is basically gonna help with like your muscle endurance from one set to the next. You can kind of do like more reps, you can recover more quickly. And then the L-citrulline is what's going to help with blood flow, just so you can get blood flow more easily to the different parts of your body. So that's kind of my workout routine, or pre-workout habit ritual, whatever you want to call it, that precedes the actual workout. And I like to start my workout by watching other people doing their warm-ups. I like that, you know, and then maybe, maybe do a little bit of this stuff for explosive stuff. So before I hit my first working set, I'm just doing some dynamic warm up for the specific muscle group I'm about to hit. In this case, I'm hitting the chest. So I'm doing these arm circles that are kind of like behind the body chest openers as opposed to just like, you know, in front of the body, it's not really stretching the chest. Here, the circles are. I'll do two arms at once. I'll do one arm at a time, just getting that full range of motion. And uh, this is really just to get the blood flowing to the exact joints and muscles that I'm about to work. And I just make sure that I'm Hitting both sides, feeling sufficiently warmed up. This is the dynamic component. And then as soon as I've kind of gone through my little routine, the full routine is usually just like a couple minutes. I'm only doing a couple seconds here. But after I do that is when I'll go into the actual exercise. And I'm basically gonna hit one to two warm up sets where it's completely non-fatiguing but still hitting the exact exercise. So if I'm normally gonna do like 200 plus pounds, I'm probably only gonna hit like 100 pounds or so for the warm up. And uh, with an exercise like this, I wanna make sure that the positioning is where I want it. So I'm getting the right amount of range of motion for my body. And uh, I usually make the warm up sets just like five to seven reps. Again, totally non-fatiguing, just directly stimulating the muscle fibers I'm about to work. So that's the concept for the warm up. So one thing for me pretty much across the board is that I've had many like micro injuries over time so I have to kind of adapt my workouts accordingly. So one example is this, I was in a car accident where my hand was on the steering wheel and my ulna bone jutted through my TFCC, tore a bunch of cartilage in here. So I still have some like residual pain from that but it flares up more when I'm in a, supinate, or a pronated position or a fully supinated position. So I try to go toward neutral. So when I put this on the horizontal press machine, it takes my grip from here to there. Oh, okay. Just rotates it slightly. Same exercise otherwise, but it is just way more comfortable on my specific body. And then, uh, same concept with this. This is for the same injury, and it's a very specific type of uh, wrist strap that's very flexible, very comfortable, um, not rigid, but just kind of holds together that TFCC area, again, so it just doesn't flare up with pain because pain is ultimately going to kind of deter you away from the amount of weight that you can press otherwise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do all of that. And then I, uh, I do the actual working set after usually like a second warm up. So I just did my first warm up at very lightweight, doing a couple reps, slightly more weight. Just like two or three. So now I'm used to like slightly heavier and then I'll go to like my actual working weight. So like 220 to 230. With, with, with me personally, this is a personal question. I always like to try to see if I can use every single muscle fiber. So I would let these come further backwards. Would that yeah. be, is so that something? If it doesn't cause you pain, you absolutely should. Okay. It's just, for me, that's actually another micro injury I had a long time ago where I tore a bunch of the, um, the muscle fibers in this area. I had like a, a, a pec strain or tear. And so when I go further in the range of motion, it tends to aggravate that oh, okay. sometimes. 
And then I also had, I know I have so many micro injuries over time, I had a supraspinatus tear, which is something that connects right here on your collarbone. It's basically during like the COVID era of creative workouts at home. I did these decline push-ups with 45 pounds on my back with extra range of motion on my hands. So when I had all of that force at once, it caused a tear right there. Oh, shit. All of the things I've just described are very controlled now where they don't tend to cause me pain as long as I'm diligent. So this is one example where it's like, I used to totally do you know complete full range of motion that can totally be better for hypertrophy. But if you can't, like me, without pain, you, have to. you might as well. You know? So if you're, if you're teaching a client you'll, and, they, and they are able to do it, you let full range is always better. 100%. Okay, good. At least I was good with that. Yeah, yeah you're good wondering. with that. You're good with that. <laughs> and then uh, the key with an actual set now is I'm going for what's called RP8, meaning, meaning a rating of perceived exertion of 8 out of 10. Effectively, I'm trying to get two reps from failure. I'm not going to total failure, but I'm getting darn close to it. Okay. So it has to be challenging. So for me, that was two reps from failure. Wow. Yeah, and it's the kind of thing where like, if someone's just starting out, they probably don't have a good gauge of where that two reps from failure is. Yep. And so I'll typically have them do what's called like a, a progressive set or a pyramid, where they start with high reps, low weight, and they gradually go higher in weight, lower in reps, so they can get a better idea of like, okay, what does really heavy feel like for me? Yep. How heavy can I go if I was doing slightly fewer reps? And then as time goes on, they'll just have a better gauge of fatigue and they can get to that consistent RP8. Okay. So it would be like, two, you would say it's 80% then? Or? Two reps from failure. So not necessarily 80%, but like literally you're just on the cusp of reaching total failure, like okay. two reps from it. Okay. You should be struggling, it should be hard, it should be fatiguing, but not so fatiguing that the next set or two suffers. Okay. Like I want to be able to do the same number of reps and the same amount of weight in every set of the exercise all right yeah nice how do you so so today you have a chest workout right oh yeah good question so my split and this is different than what i have most of my clients do but i do a total body split so i hit something from upper and something from lower every single day but each muscle group i give at least 48 hours rest between workouts okay so if i'm doing chest today not doing any chest tomorrow but i could do it the next day or i could do it the day after that it's kind of like my choice depending on how my fatigue levels are feeling and whether it's a rest day or not, things like that. But like, for example, I could be hitting chest and hamstrings and calves and back in one day. Like that would be a total body workout for me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nice. And so yeah, it's like doing total body is the easiest to mess up and that's why I don't have most of my clients do it because like if you push yourself too hard in one workout and you then have to do total body the next day or have the same muscle group a day after that, you don't want residual fatigue to make your workout suffer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. kind of thing. So most of my clients are doing somewhere between 1.5 to 2X frequency per week, meaning that across the whole week, they'll probably hit their chest twice, they'll hit their quads twice, they'll hit their glutes twice. Everything is usually hit twice. Sometimes if they hit it really, really hard, it might become an average of like 1.5 times a week, where it's okay. like some weeks it's one, some weeks it's two, and vice versa. Okay. Yeah. And how many exercises you take? Like if you're doing chest, you have... So within my total body workout, if I'm doing chest, I'm only doing probably two exercises, one at the very beginning of the workout, one at the very end, so I can rest in between before I hit it hard again. If I was doing more of a push-pull leg split, where you're hitting like you know, all of your chest or half of your chest volume for the whole week in one workout, then I'm probably doing three, maybe four uh, exercises. Okay. What matters most really is the number of sets per muscle group per week. So for the chest across the entire training week, I'm going for somewhere between 10 and 20 sets. So if I do three or four sets of this exercise today, that's three to four out of my 10 to 20 of the week. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, very calculated, very... Uh, yeah, you know, like anything else. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so now, you know, we've just chatted for probably two or three minutes. On average, my rest time between sets is about two or three minutes. That's usually the amount of time it takes to recover sufficiently to be able to hit the exact same numbers you did in the previous set. Oh, okay. If you have a minute or less, 
uh, it's suboptimal for hypertrophy, meaning like the actual process of muscle building. It doesn't mean you won't get any benefit from it, but it's like if that's your core primary goal, that two to three minutes is most optimal if you have the time. Okay. Yeah. And you notice I have all these caveats like the if you have the time, because it's like if someone legitimately only has say 30, 45 minutes, it's better for them to get more exercise in with less rest time than to just not do the workout, you know what I mean? Yeah, you see, with, with me, I, because I, I, I'm not a big super fan of uh, weight training, so everything yeah, yeah. I do is supersets. Right. So it's a pu pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling, push, and I go back and forth, next four. Yeah. Pushing, pulling, next two, and then I do all these sets, and then I get the hell out of there in, in, in 35, 40 minutes. But right. I did like 10 exercises, I do high reps always, yeah. so meaning I go uh, around 20 repetitions I try to do, and everything is pushing, pulling the whole time, Yeah. and I'm out. Yeah, and but I guess one I, thing. Yeah, yeah but one I cannot do it too many times a week, of course, because totally. that would not be right. Yeah, and one thing I should add is that, especially when I'm going for time efficiency, I will do the supersetting method as well. So, like, if I was doing chest, I would superset with either a back exercise or a calf exercise or something completely unrelated, yep. because those aren't going to cause fatigue carryover yep. almost at all, yep. and you can get in and out, and it's like your rest time just becomes work time for another muscle group. That's and vice that, versa. Yeah, that's what I yeah. always try to do. Yeah, yeah. Very close. That was close to one set of total fatigue, right? Yeah, almost, almost <laughs> there. And one thing also that I should note: you mentioned that you're doing normally like 20 sets, or not 20 sets, 20 reps. The research is um, very clear that as long as you are below 30 reps per set and you're reaching sufficient fatigue, your hypertrophy potential or potential for muscle building is approximately equal. However, let's say you were doing like 50 to 100 reps per set. Yeah, yeah. Even if you reach total failure, your hypertrophy potential is literally about half. Oh wow. So it's like definitely not recommended uh, if you have muscle building goals to do more than 30 reps on any sort of regular basis. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Yeah, I always, did, I did for my, because of fighting, it's got 30 minute fights, that's in Japan, one round, 30 minutes. Okay, let's go 30 minutes ballistic or, or 35 or 40 minutes, yeah. right? A little bit extra. Everything pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling. And then many times what I used to do, I do a pushing, pulling exercise, and then for instance, kicking a back for one minute. Pulling, pushing, kicking a back for a minute. Then yeah. I put a, a, a conditioning workout in between it as well. Or one minute, I, I throw knees, you know, five right knees, five left knees, and I just keep on going, and I go back to the, so always combine stamina with endurance, because that's what fighting is. You're fighting, but you're also getting tired, you know, so you have to both. That's the both well. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Like in, in my world, the technical term for that is called training specificity, okay. which basically just means that whatever you are training for, your training should be as direct of a carryover to that as possible. Okay. So like if you were doing fighting training, what I'm doing wouldn't be nearly as direct as if you were doing a high endurance or high muscle endurance activity where it's like you have to go for longer really fast with almost no breaks. Because yeah. that in your world has way more direct carryover to fighting. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. 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 Heck yeah. Cool. Sniff somebody. <laughs> all right, so of all the exercises I do, I would say the one that I most recently changed is this one. So I've always done this exercise just called calf press on leg press, which is where you're just, you know, doing this. And the reason for this at a very high level is when you're at a straight leg position like this, it primarily works what's called the gastroc, which is the larger part of the calf as opposed to the soleus, which is the smaller one. And if people want big calves, I'm not saying I have big calves, but you'd work the gastroc because that's the meatier part. It's like on the outside, whereas the soleus is kind of hidden underneath. It's much smaller. But what I have found very recently in the research is that this exercise in particular has a very clear sticking point. And what that means is this is the fully stretch position. This is the fully shortened position. But to get to here when you're fatigued is darn near impossible. So if you go from the stretch position to neutral, that you can go for days. And the research has very directly shown that because of that, you can, once you reach failure in the full range of motion, you can then do partials from neutral to stretched, neutral okay. to stretched. And you can go so much longer there 
and you can actually get more hypertrophy because of it. So I've made that change now, where it's like, I'll do as many as I can to this. Once I can no longer get there, then I'll do forced partials. Okay. And uh, it's been like the best calf change I've made oh, by wow. far. Yeah. And, 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 and we were talking about this before. You see this, like I said, I, I always want to use everything in the muscle. So my bicep flex curls, I try to stretch my arms. I like the machine also where I can lay it flat yeah. because it's totally isolated. But you see some people and they only, they're pumping like this. What would be the reason for that? So ego, like the oh, only reason okay. they're doing is because they just want to pump out more reps for like no reason. And the ironic thing for that is that there is direct research on the bicep curl that shows that if you were to do partials, you'd get way more benefit from the bottom portion partials. Yeah. Because stretching at longer muscle lengths, yep. so the bicep here is long, here it's short. If you go here, same concept with this, this is actually way more benefit than this. This yep. is almost nothing, this is almost everything. You see, I do this for my, the, my the, this is affected area for the people can see, right? It's all atrophied. So many times I do the curls and then at the very end, I try, just try to do this like little bits because it really fires the bottom part of yeah. the biceps that I want to do something. I actually did a couple of days ago, I have muscle aches, which is a good sign because normally with the nerve damage I have, I don't have that. Yeah, so. that's exciting. So yeah, let's see what happens. Dr. Bueller, the guy in Utah, we'll talk about that. I'm going to interview that guy. That guy is freaking amazing. Yeah, Bueller. 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 Yeah, it's like, you remember oh. Ferris Bueller's day oh, off? Oh, Ferris Bueller's <laughs> day <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to bring him in here. Yeah. <laughs> Bueller. Bueller, um, no, but the, uh, the other thing that's cool about that, there is direct research on the biceps showing that it is one of the muscle groups where the mind-muscle connection matters. And what I mean is that there are certain exercises, for example, a chest press. It's so compound and it's such a large muscle group that theoretically, as long as you're going through the range of motion, you're going to get all of the benefit from it as long as you're going to a sufficient level of fatigue. However, there is research on the bicep showing that if you just passively do bicep curls through the full range of motion, you're not thinking about the contraction, you can actually enhance that, get slightly more benefit if you're actively focused on the muscle and thinking about squeezing it. And it isn't known exactly why, but just the fact that it's smaller, it's more isolated, isn't as compound or large as the chest, is probably something to do with it. But that's all to say, if you're doing bicep curls, you should probably be actively thinking about the contraction. That's, that's the same with the breathing exercise number two. You think about the back and yeah. you activate those muscles. You know what I did in the beginning also with my back, with my nerve damage, because they told me, and I don't know if this is true, you can do it, and then later on I did it with electric stim. So once you do it, start tapping your biceps and then start doing the biceps exercise because apparently that brings attention to the biceps. It's kind of what you're saying, yeah. focusing on the bicep. Yeah, so it's 100% real. The technical term is proprioception. It's just the idea that if you touch something, you literally have to think about it because it's now like registering with your brain. Yeah. So it's like when I'm talking about squeezing, I'm not touching it, but I'm still like, okay, I have to focus on the contraction. But if someone's there touching this, it's impossible not to think about it because yeah. you're like, oh wow, this is the exact thing I have to work right now. Okay, good, 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 yeah. good. Yeah. Look at that. Who who would have known that I got the right information? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm such a knucklehead sometimes. Yeah. I just do things because it makes me feel good, you know. And then I, later I find out, oh, it was actually a good thing to do. But it makes total sense, you know. The more the more you engage, the better it is. Right. 100%. It's so simple. So. Hundred percent. Cool. Do you do also a little bit higher on here, and then uh, because now you dropped your heels behind it, I saw. Yes. And all the stretch, and then also you, you can. So this exercise in particular, this is a leg press machine, and I'm makeshifting it into a calf machine. Yeah. So if I was up here, this is for the calf. Yeah. Or sorry, for the for the quad. If I'm down here, this is just for the calf. Notice that my leg stays straight the whole time, which means that my quadricep isn't working at all. Yep. It's literally just the calf. But then, sort of thing. but then when you get fatigued, you, you're using only this bottom part, right? But what if you put your foot here, which is going to be hard in this machine, I believe, yeah. and then only do these little bump ups? Good question. So that's actually very related to the first thing I was talking about with like, once you reach fatigue, yep. you can do partials. What you're referring to is actually how I first came to find out about that. It's something called a weighted calf jump. So you can put one leg up here, oh, and now okay. what I can do is I can push myself to the top, and now I control lower on that one. Oh, push wow. myself to the top, control lower. And this is what's called a forced eccentric, because basically there's two ranges of motion for every exercise. There's the concentric, which is the shortening phase. There's the eccentric, which is the lengthening phase. And we're all 20 to 60% stronger eccentrically. Yep. It's the concept that like, if you loaded up, say, 300 pounds on a bench press, you could lower that, 
but very few people can raise that back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same concept applies to the calf here. So if I go and I do this weighted calf jump, I've now gone through the concentric without any need for help here, and then I'm control lowering it on the eccentric here. I'm way stronger there, so even when I reach failure here, I can keep going to failure eccentrically. Oh, wow. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I love yeah. that. So it's all about just like the intensity techniques that you decide to employ. And uh, the honest truth is that like what I'm talking about and these little nuances, that's like the final, call it 5%. You can do zero intensity techniques, get like 90, 95% of the results. But if you're at that point where you're already advanced and you're trying to become a lead and above, sometimes you have to employ these additional intensity techniques or you just can't further progress. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah I love it. Cool. Very cool. Yep. All right. So one thing you'll notice is I always carry a water bottle with me. It's a 40 ounce thermoflask, so I try and drink it at least three times a day. And I'm especially drinking it during a workout. On average, you want to be getting like one to two cups of water in per half hour of workout. And the reason for that is even like 1% dehydration, meaning 1% of your body weight, can substantially reduce anything from strength to muscle endurance to recovery. Everything is impaired. Jeez. So like if you weigh, 100, how much you weigh, 200 pounds? Yeah, 210. Okay, so 1% of your body weight then is like two pounds. Yeah. And like sweating, you can very easily sweat two pounds, as you know probably from like cutting weight for fighting. Oh, yeah. So that means that you need to be taking in that much water to counteract that from other happening. By contrast, if someone, say, wasn't drinking any water throughout a workout and they went from beginning to end of workout, you can guarantee that by the end, their strength has been impaired. And so they could totally make gains from drinking water. Oh, man, this is crazy for us because when I came to America, we go and we do a, a striking classes, whatever it is, they go, eh, time, water break. And, and all these Dutch guys, that go like, excuse me? And it goes, <laughs> water break. We don't do that in Holland, you know? We just go one hour, an hour and a half. That's just, that's not smart then. Yeah. We no. should have been drinking in between. Yeah. It's kind of like what we were talking about earlier. It's like just because something has worked doesn't mean it's working the best it could. Ah, uh, you see. You know? Yeah, you see? You live, you learn. Yeah. <laughs> I should have known it because I was, I was laughing at people. I go, we, do, we don't do that in Holland. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a smarter thing to do, yeah. I you know. And it's like when I first started working out, for some reason, I almost had an ego with drinking water where I was like, oh, I don't need water. I'll yeah. go through the whole workout. I'll, I'll drink after. It'll be my reward. But that's just not the right way to do it. It's like have the water with you, drink eight to twelve, eight to sixteen ounces of water every half hour. You're in a much better spot because wow. of it. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so this is the no conformity arm trainer. Basically, it's something that you can put on that effectively allows you to hyper isolate the biceps. So. You were talking about the preacher curl machine before, which is like that machine where you can put your uh, arms against it and curl. You yeah, know what I'm no, about? Yeah, I, I just take a flat thing so my arm is completely flat. Oh, okay. I, I was doing it literally with three pounds. Yeah. And I had trouble. Okay. So that's how weak the arm was. Because I figured if I start here, then I, the muscle starts here, and this needs to be filled the bottom. Mm. So I always stretched it. Got it. So that's why I believe in this thing. It's way better. Yeah. Than so. Most. And the, the thing that's super interesting with this is that this is positioning your elbows slightly in front of your torso. Notice like if they were hanging straight down, they'd be here. This is about 10 degrees of what's called shoulder flexion. So like this is the action of shoulder flexion and it push, positions them here. The reason that matters is that um, there's something called EMG, which is electromyography. It shows the activation level of a, mu of a muscle. It's not the end all be all. It's not the most important indicator of like muscle activation or uh, mechanical tension, but it is an indicator that's like, okay, if you see higher EMG data, there's at least a good chance that we're working it more. And that's all to say, EMG data shows that if you can be 10 degrees forward with the elbow placement, that should have about the highest EMG activation that you can have. Oh. So I'm intentionally doing the, the exercise here, but even if you forget everything I just said, putting your elbows here now forces you into an isolated position. You can't move. Yep. And that means I'm only working the biceps. So that's why I use this. I love it. So similar concept with like the bench, uh, like the horizontal press, I'm starting with like a warm up, So it's like a non-fatiguing weight where I'm just gonna do like five to seven reps. And that way I know I'm very directly working the muscle group. I can feel the blood flowing to that area. And then I grab higher weight. Mm-hmm. <sighs> 
So how many reps you did? 19. Okay, so without this thing, you probably can do at least 25 or 30, right? Especially if I was swinging around more. That's yeah. because it's supporting muscles, are starting, you start cheating. This is completely isolating it. Yeah, Big yeah. difference. exactly. And it's like, similar to what I was talking about with um, the calves, where it's like you reach a point of, you know, like a sticking point of sorts. If I was to move 0%, I would hit that sticking point way sooner. With this, I'm probably moving like, call it 10 to 15%. Like you can notice like little movements of my body. Yeah, yeah. But if I didn't have this, I might be more like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, doing yeah. that. Cool and point. then it's just like, you're not working the target muscle group as much. Yeah, and is, is this like, when I can't do it anymore, what I'm doing, I'm throwing it up and then I start dropping it really slow. Yeah. Is that a good thing? Yeah, so that's the exact same concept I was talking with the calves of the weighted calf jumps. Yep. It's a forced eccentric. It's that concept again that, we're all 20 to 60% stronger eccentrically. Yep. So you're gonna reach failure here, but if you can get the weight to here, now you can control lower and you can go way longer. And you're still working those muscles. Exactly. I'm gonna get one of these things because I think it's really good for this bicep. Yeah, I think yeah. you'd really like it. Um, and then especially if you combine it with that mind-muscle connection concept of like, I'm actively thinking, squeezing thinking, it, thinking, thinking, thinking yeah. it, that'll help. And then another thing, if you're not already, is to take advantage of the fact that the biceps have two functions. A lot of people only think of one function, which is this, it's called elbow flexion. It's going from a straight arm to a bent. The other function is what's called wrist supination, it's this. So it's like if you're to hold a weight, I'm gonna take this off so I can demonstrate. If you hold a weight and you just turn your arm, you'll start to feel the bicep even with no other movement yeah, 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 yeah. because that act of wrist supination has to be controlled by something and that's your bicep. So. That would be a good exercise for me too. For I'll show you in work? a second. Don't do exactly that, I'll show you. Okay. That was more so to demonstrate that that's the function of it. But what that means is you want to have two different bicep variations. One is elbow flexion, which is this. I'm just bending the arm. But then you can combine it, go to here. And now when I curl up, I'm trying to turn my wrist to the outside. Oh, wow. okay. So it's that act of wrist supination. And uh, you can do it in a couple of different ways. You can either be supinated the whole time, and supinated for context just means if this is neutral, supinated is turning the wrist up like that. So that's the function of the bicep. So you could either be in a supinated position and then just kind of like hyper supinate, go even further, or you can start in this hammer position like this, neutral, and curl, kind of rotate well, yeah, as you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then same concept, when you're doing that, think of the mind-muscle connection. Sorry, I just spit a little bit. <laughs> Think of the mind-muscle connection of the actual turning part. Because one thing you'll probably notice is that when you're doing this, I'm turning out, I'm feeling the activation right here specifically. Like, as opposed to this side of my bicep, I'm literally feeling this part is turning. And you can even see it, like, as I'm turning, you can see the fle it yep. flexes a little bit. By contrast, if I'm doing a hammer curl, I can feel it more, like, holistically, maybe even a little bit more on the outside. Okay. That kind of thing. So you want to take advantage of the multiple functionality of the bicep. What, what would you suggest for me to fill this up? Like, I, I do these ones, right? I do these ones, I do hammers, I do hammers like this, and I do reversed. Yeah. Which one would be a good one for me? Because this, the, just that turning, that already activates this also, right? Yeah. I should really try that. Yeah, so I mean, this will help you feel it, but this is not going to really hypertrophy that, yeah, which so is why I would recommend doing this and turning to the outside. Oh, okay. okay. That's where you're really gonna start to feel like, especially in that bottom portion. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Cool. Sweet. So that's biceps. Biceps. Got another one? Yes. We got another one. Let's do another one and then we're good. So basically I'm setting up what are called pit shark RDLs. This is the pit shark machine RDLs, Romanian deadlift. It's a hamstring exercise and I am going to be performing it in a very makeshift way that has the best grip potential possible and that'll make sense in a second. So this is just like holding a standard bar. So like most people do RDLs and they're just kind of like right here holding onto a barbell. But what I can do, I can attach these. These are called the Kensui Swissies. They weigh one pound and they can support 800. And you can attach it to really any bar and now you have a neutral grip. And this allows me to have basically maximum um, grip potential because we're way stronger in a neutral grip than we are in a pronated grip. And so this just allows me to not have to worry about grip fatigue. 
The thing that I like about this machine specifically is it takes advantage of basically the backward movement of my hips. Like notice that my legs stay pretty straight the whole time. All I'm doing is pushing the hips back, 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 and I can feel my hamstrings with almost no weight at all completely engaged. So then when I add weight, it's kind of like one of the best RDL variations you can possibly have. One thing that's particularly important on really any variation that you do of a deadlift is that your back stays flat the entire time. And so here I'm pulling out a weightlifting belt. And the thing that's unique about this is that it is relatively thin. So it's not going to be uncomfortable with like having leather press into your body. More so what this is, it's an ab plate. So this is a very thin plastic piece that like when I flex my abs outward, I can fully feel like the, the rock hardness of it without it impairing my range of motion. And then it does have the piece on the back that's still keeping everything flat. And even if, again, you forget everything I just said, it has the physical reminder to keep my back flat. So like if I was starting to hunch like this, I would feel this kind of jutting into my back telling me like, nope, keep straight. And so that way when I'm doing the RDL, I stay straight and flat the whole time. And the key on this in general is you want to keep the bar as close to your body as possible. One of the cues is to scrape your shins without literally scraping them. And this way, you're just keeping the weight where it's supposed to be to maintain as strong as a, of a position for the hamstrings specifically as possible. This, by the way, this would be a really great uh, exercise for takedown defense. Strong hips also. Heck yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Good one. And that's hamstrings. Yep. Cool. Okay, so, so far we've hit chest, calves, biceps, and hamstrings, and now we're gonna hit back. So I usually hit five to six total exercises for a total body workout. Again, just something from upper, something from lower. So this is just a back exercise. This is a, a row variation. It's a relatively low row, which is going to focus on both the traps and the lats. And so I'm just thinking about trying to come to a full stretch at the front and a full contraction at the back. A lot of people will kind of stop like here, not letting the full stretch happen. I like to allow the full stretch and that's how you can really feel the lat yeah. activating as opposed to staying back here, you're not in like full range of motion. Um, you can do this one at a time or two at once. But one of the things I like to emphasize with this specific exercise is um, grip because a lot of people's grip will give out before their back does. And again, if hypertrophy is your primary goal, you don't want that to happen. It's not that you don't want to build your grip, it's just that if grip is deterring you from doing reps that you could otherwise do, you should do something to counteract the grip fatigue. So I use these. These are, uh, they're called figure eights. And so you can use a lifting strap, but a figure eight is just a very specific type of lifting strap. And basically what it does is, it transfers the weight to your wrist and then you wrap it around whatever you are using and then it goes over your wrist again. So now it's fully transferring the weight to my wrist. And so what this means is that, I'm gonna exaggerate, I would never do this in an actual set, but let's yeah. say that I don't grab it at all. I can still perform the exercise because it's literally, it's not coming from my fingers, it's coming from my wrist. Yeah. And then adding the hands, now you have a good grip and the weight is pretty much just on your wrist. Nice. So this way I can go way longer uh, and do heavier weight, that sort of thing. Nice. So I'll show what a set looks like of that. And I'd say in general, when an exercise allows you to do one arm at a time as opposed to two at once, it's a good time to do one arm at a time yeah. just to make sure you don't core. develop a muscle imbalance. Yeah, and then the core is also engaged, right? Yeah, yeah, I to like counteract. The one arm pull ups and pulls all up. I do yeah. punching drills. It's yeah. really good also for the side calls and the pull, and then I do the reverse muscle as well. Totally, yeah. So, and then with this one, I try and get a wide base of support. Like I could be here and do it just fine, but if I'm here, now I can like really lock into position, establish total body rigidity. And you can even, it even has this little bar here so you can really lock yourself in. 
and that's all so that you can generate as much force as possible with the target muscle group. So it's kind of like the only thing in my body right now that's moving is the target muscle. Nice. So I'm making sure I'm taking that through a full range of motion. And again, my grip, I could theoretically let go and yeah. it's all in uh, the forearm. I love it. And it almost has my name on it, see, boss. <laughs> boss, <laughs> just mispronounced yeah. and misspelled. Dumbasses. <laughs> And this is one of those ones where like, you'll reach fatigue in this earlier part of the range of motion. So if you wanted to add an intensity technique, you could thrust it back, control it forward, thrust it back, control it forward. And then you see, after I've thrusted it back a couple times, if I tried to not thrust it back, it's like I'm stuck. Yeah. But I could just do that and get a little bit more nice. volume in there. And then of course you gotta balance it out, do the other side. And one thing I haven't talked about is breathing. When you're breathing for exercising, you want to exhale on the shortening or concentric phase. So here, and that just allows you to generate again as much force as possible for the concentric phase, which is the harder portion. That's nice. a row. <laughs> Heck yeah. It's really nice equipment here, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's some really cool stuff. Look at this thing, you can't pick up with the thing. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, no, they got the best stuff here. <sighs> cool. Like I said, a different kind of influencer. You almost cannot call him an influencer. I mean, the, the detail, the attention to detail, that's what I love about him and that's why we had him involved also with the O2 train, of course. Patrick, this was awesome. Thank you, man, this uh, was a blast. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I actually learned a lot, and I was very happy with the things that I asked that I used to do that they were actually good to do. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a cool thing when you find out the things you've been doing are backed by science, but if you don't know it, and then you can learn the science, then you can apply it. But the problem was, though, in the beginning, when we were having the breakfast and we were talking about food, I didn't do that really well when I was competing, <laughs> only for my last fight. But guess what? The power training, at least I did that correctly because I was getting worried, especially with my many repetitions. But then you said after 30, and I go, oh, that's mm. good. Because in the past, I used to do everything 25. Yeah. So what I was still on the 30 was still okay. And supersets are okay. Just don't do it too many times a week. Bada bing, bada boom. Yeah. And, and the, now the we know biggest why like consistency this. that I've seen between you and me, see between you and me, despite us having very different you know, goals and approaches, is the consistency of habits, where it's just like you've done the same thing every day yep. for years on end, maybe with small tweaks here and there, but it's that consistency with action every day. That's it, I always say, you know, if, you, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So if something works for me, it's the same when I surround myself with a certain team, you know, like my fighting team. That stayed with me my entire career. I always think that if I would let one go, that could destroy the whole freaking magic that is going on right now. So that's what I always tell people. Once you start with a certain person and you start getting big, stay with that person. Don't start to cut ties and say, oh, I don't want to pay him 10%. Don't do that. I saw this a lot with fighters who did that, and then suddenly they start losing. I think you're messing with the universe. We don't want to mess with the universe. Yeah. All right. Speaking of universe, though, in your universe, in Planet Boss, you are El Guapo. Yes. Does that make me... El Guapito. El Guapito. Well, how many pounds are you? You're under um, 200. 185. 185. Yeah, he's El Guapito. There we That's go. That's it. And otherwise, he's the one with the hair and the one without the hair. So we got it both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Appreciate Thanks you, again, brother. You're very welcome. Good Godspeed. Man. Check him out. If you want to do personal training, he does it also online. You got to check him out. We have all the details below this video.